Ah! Hmm. All right, ten more minutes of chanting, and then you guys have to go to bed. Hmm. I'm impressed. You won't get Angel. Hmm. You think you can fight me? I'm not a demon, little girl. I am something that you can't even conceive. The first evil. Beyond sin. Beyond death. I am the thing that darkness fears. You'll never see me, but I am everywhere. Every being, every thought, every drop of hate. All right, I get it. You're evil. Do we have to chat about it all day? Angel will be dead by sunrise. Your Christmas will be his wake. No. You have no idea what you're dealing with. Let me guess. Is it evil? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Still Slaying, a Buffyverse podcast. I'm Penny. And I'm Kelly. And I'm Kara. This episode, we're going to be discussing Season 3, Episode 10, Amends, directed and written by JW. The original air date of this one is December 15th, 1998, right in the middle of the Christmas season. And the episode had an audience of 4.3 million households for its original airing. You may have noticed a new voice that you haven't heard on the podcast before so we want to welcome kelly to still slaying welcome kelly yay (laughs) thanks uh kelly want to tell us just a little bit about your history with the buffy and angel franchises and uh where were you in fall of 98 well i came to buffy kind of late probably about the same time angel was starting nice um and an ex that i was with like loved buffy and so he got me into it i feel like that's a good time to jump in you have yeah. so much material to catch up on <laughs> yeah yeah you know and like we couldn't just automatically start over so i just jumped in and the thing about probably part of why i like angel i mean he's because you got it from the beginning mm-hmm. yeah and part of what it- is interesting about doing this podcast so many years after the show aired is how different TV shows are created today from back then, and especially broadcast Mm -hmm. versus streaming that you can jump in at the beginning of a season and pretty well follow what's going on without too much trouble. Whereas now, Mm -hmm. like you would never jump into like season four of game of Thrones and be like, I'll catch up. (laughs) You know, Uh, it's so much more dense. Terrible choice. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and you have to see every episode, whereas broadcast shows were designed so that you could miss some and still follow them and yeah. not lose viewers. Both are valid. They're just different ways of of presenting the material. Yeah. Let's go back to the end of 1998. <laughs> I remember this was kind of like the peak of, you know, I'm a fifth grader. And (laughs) getting ready for middle school, I do remember the number one song in the U.S. playing over and over again, I'm Your Angel, still by R. Kelly and Celine Dion. Of course, in the U.K., the number one song is Believe by Cher. I wonder if that still ranks on the Billboard charts today. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) And again, at the U.S. box office, number one is still A Bug's Life, and number two is Ants. So they've got, you know, a monopoly on the (laughs) movies right now, animated bugs. And I thought it'd be fun to throw in what the best-selling books were during this month. And at this point, back in December of 1998, we've got Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Albom and Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden. 
I remember those two books being popular mm-hmm. so well. That was oh, a yeah. time, you know, pre-Kindle, when riding on the subway, sometimes you would look down the car and you could see like what everyone was reading. And oh, sometimes yeah. it would be like all <laughs> the same book. Like That's if a book so was funny. popular enough, you'd see like 20 people reading the same book. I remember oh, seeing so Harry Potter like that. And I remember mm-hmm. Memoirs of oh, a Geisha yeah. just being everywhere. A book really was everywhere. Yeah. I think I read it the next year in sixth grade or show, so, and I probably shouldn't. Not at that, yeah. not at that time. But I also book- read Helter Skelter that year, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Oh, no problem. Yeah, it's it's like I was I was reading my first like Stephen King in middle school, and you know, not sleeping mm-hmm. at night. Yeah, because I was yep. terrified of. Yeah pets coming back to life and ghosts and also i uh i watched invasion of the body snatchers alone at night at that age as well so that's when all my insomnia problems really started yeah that seems (laughs) fair (laughs) understandably so on this day also the space shuttle endeavor was scheduled to land at cape canaveral following an 11-day international space station mission The House of Lords in London is scheduled to hear an appeal by General Augusto Pinochet. We've talked about him before. That's the Chilean dictator who was seeking asylum and to escape from his war crime trials in Chile. So the House of Lords in London was hearing his appeal to overturn its three to two ruling that he does not have immunity from arrest as a foreign former foreign head of state. During the week of December 13th, 1998. On the 16th, the Iraq disarmament crisis was going ongoing with Operation Desert Fox, in which the United States and United Kingdom bombed targets in Iraq to degrade its ability to produce, store, maintain, and deliver weapons of mass destruction. I threw this next one in for a little bit of levity. Okay. <laughs> it's also Probably good context that. for yeah. what the culture was like at the time. Oh, yeah. On December 18th, Romantic comedy film You've Got Mail, starring Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, directed by by Nora Ephron, and written by sisters Nora and Delia Ephron, is released. I loved that movie. That was one. Of my oh favorites. yeah, I hate Such that movie. Such a dated reference now too. Yeah, <laughs> all I the mean, AOL. I'm... Yeah, and the yeah. You've Got Mail. Yeah, it's just <laughs> not part of our lives anymore. <laughs> and then on December nineteenth, nineteen ninety eight, the U.S. House of Rep- Representatives votes to impeach President Bill Clinton over the Lewinsky scandal, forwarding the articles of impeachment to the Senate for a trial. What a weird time that was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was finishing up basic training. Like, I was in the Army. That's right, you were in the Army. Yes. Another military vet. Thank you for your service. (laughs) Yes. Just like Steve. Uh, Were you... Were you overseas? No. If you were in basic training, no. you were here. You were yeah. in the state. Where did you go yeah. through basic training? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. Uh, how long were you in the service? I I was only in a little over a year. I got pregnant and ended up taking, like, I got an honorable discharge. It was my second baby, and I just decided I didn't want to risk getting deployed and being away from them. I completely understand that. So we've added a new section to the podcast, and it's pop culture references that happened within the episode. We used to just bring this up sort of throughout our discussion, and now we're just making it a section so that it's a little bit more easy to keep track of. Kara, start us off. So the first one is when Buffy mentions Roast Beast, this is a reference to the 1957 Christmas classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss, of course, in which Roast Beast is a traditional Christmas dinner for the Who's in Whoville. This next one is Buffy compares a prophetic textbook with The Sun a 1983 to 2012 supermarket tabloid widely regarded as sensationalist. That's funny because I didn't think that's what that reference was. I thought she meant the literal son. Oh, (laughs) I thought of the, I immediately thought of the tabloid. I wonder what they actually intended, but I just remember seeing that everywhere. It was was always like some sort of 
weird pregnancy or mm -hmm. conspiracy. I kind of miss the supermarket tabloids. Like Weekly World News always had oh, yeah. like, really unbelievable, ridiculous stuff about like alien abductions. And there was a whole <laughs> thing in the 90s about Bat Boy and Bat Boy is on the loose. That was in the oh, early yeah. 90s. Yeah. Good Lord. They were very entertaining. And now they're all just like celebrity, like paparazzi stalker photos and yeah. you know, stories about women who have 19 babies and stuff. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one is Giles' description of the har Harbingers includes the words, they're rebels and they'll never, ever be any good. Mocking the book's dramatic description by paraphrasing the crystal song, He's a Rebel. Oh, I didn't know that. Next up, the Maple Court has newspaper vending machines featuring USA Today, which is <laughs> always fun. The world's worst newspaper. Um, <laughs> the sign outside the Sun Cinema in downtown Sunnydale announces the film Abilene, which is a 1996 film which was a uh, production designed by Carrie Meyer. Carrie Meyer, who works on this show, right, is also a production yes. designer on the show. So yes. even though the show is set in late 1998, it was a 96 film as like a little nod to Carrie Meyer. That's nice. This one I liked a lot. And you got the Barry working for you. Barry Wyatt, a singer by whose songs many people have done that thing. <laughs> that thing. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> oh, Oz. Mm -hmm. And finally, I thought this one was an interesting tidbit. The weatherman that we see in here in this episode, Mark Krisky, was the weatherman for KTLA's Morning News. And KTLA was the Los Angeles WB affiliate at the oh, time. Perfect. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> With the ridiculous weather report about Sunny Dale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not going to see the sun all day. <laughs> Just to underline the point of the end of the show. It's not... It's like, because that makes sense. Not always a subtle show in the way that they write those kinds of things. Seriously. Uh, so let's get into the episode itself. I first want to welcome back Robia Lamort in the role of Jenny. I I remember when this episode aired, I was like, oh, like I was so I excited to have her back because she's such a great <laughs> character. And I thought the actor did an amazing job of channeling Jenny, but evil. Oh, I, yeah. I really <laughs> enjoyed uh, her performance and her return. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah. I, I think she, I don't know what it is. There's just the way she portrays you know both jenny and the first evil in this episode is so well balanced because you still see hints of jenny coming through but there's always something sinister underneath the surface and i think it's her her movement and her eyes and the way she talks it's i it just i think it was very subtle and brilliantly done yeah, it was like she was seducing him all at once, too. Right? Like, yeah. Like, it tormenting kind of sexy. and seducing. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, the scene where she's standing behind Giles and Giles can't see her mm -hmm. is sort of heartbreaking. Because mm -hmm. you know how badly Giles would have wanted to see her. And <sighs> Poor Giles. An angel, to be in Giles' presence and see Jenny at the same time, knowing what he took from Giles and how he took jenny from giles you know leaving that mm -hmm. scene in his apartment that was that was a hard scene to watch Ugh. it's hard not to have compassion for angel as he's going through all this but at the same time in that scene you know we have giles who is 100 percent on his guard around angel and he's got the crossbow going and everything and it's mm -hmm. such a tense and amazing scene i'm sort of jumping ahead but um <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're there now i i think that the whole story between angel and giles this episode is a lot of development for both characters uh, i think about how desperate angel was to seek out giles for help and you know he comes to the door and he's like sorry to bother you and giles laughs which is probably how i would react too. like that's <laughs> sorry to bother me like how about 
sorry for being an evil demon that tortured you like it's it's such an understatement and yeah. it's similar to when the first is is taunting angel at one point and angel's like i've i've said i'm sorry i don't know what else to say and it's like you could keep saying you're sorry like <sighs> you know like you haven't said it enough to giles and you probably should should be groveling even more but mm-hmm. I, angel's not really much of a groveler yeah. uh, no <laughs> And, but I do, I don't know, I just like that they still have Giles having a very hard time with this and that he immediately gets the crossbow because they could have made it, you know, for plot convenience sake, it could have been a lot smoother and Giles could have opened up a little bit faster. But I think the writers do a good job of paying attention to what is actually realistic and keeping up with you know the traumas that the characters have all gone through and how they would realistically respond in situations like this so that crossbow seemed very warranted yeah definitely and i was i was actually like why would you even invite him into your house i'd be like you could stand in the doorway and talk to me yeah oh yeah like i don't see any need for you to come in here ever again uh (laughs) maybe he didn't want his neighbors to hear i I don't know yeah (laughs) <laughs> the face acting by them both in that scene was pretty great like mm-hmm. yeah it's almost like so angel emotive. looks like a like a guilty dog mm-hmm. going up to giles he's just like damn it like i know i have to do yeah. this you're literally the only person i can come to <laughs> for help and then when <laughs> giles walks away and he's like but <laughs> like <laughs> and it comes, like you're just coming yeah. <laughs> and he has this this like humiliated look on his face right where he's like oh you have to invite me in as if giles would ever have forgotten that fact and yeah and then and angel is like so hating himself at this moment that like the fact that he's a vampire and he can't come in without an invitation is just it just seems it's like admitting like the, the most humiliating thing about yourself and then giles is like oh i'm well aware of that <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't Uh, worry i love giles's ability to stay cool and calm in situations like that it it makes him you know we joke a lot on this podcast about sexy giles like that's Mm -hmm. one of his sexiest qualities is how he's like always thoughtful and very rarely like loses his temper like when he comes back with that crossbow I'm just like, why is this? Why is this attractive? Yeah, why am I attracted to Giles right now? <laughs> the actor was 43 at the time, so it's a lot less confusing than when no, no. we find like the teenager type actors attractive. Like this is, I feel God. good about this one. Like, yeah, yeah. Age this is safe. It's like yeah. having. I had told Penny when I was watching salt burn i had to google jacob alordi to make sure i wasn't being too creepy <laughs> Whoa, yeah. enjoying that movie i was like wait a second how old is this guy this is not great <laughs> have you have you seen salt burn kelly no, it's wild I, it's another one i need to yeah i sweet. really I find the it. right time to watch it <laughs> yeah yeah don't watch it with children um. yeah no, no. <laughs> Um, I do like that despite his personal feelings about Angel, Giles recognized that this is a danger and he was looking into it before Buffy even approached him. You know, he knows like we don't, as much as he doesn't like Angel with a soul because of everything that happened, he doesn't want Angel without a soul. Yeah. Right. Although I just wonder why he didn't speak up to Buffy sooner, like before she came to him. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he he's not the best communicator <laughs> and in multiple ways, but it's just so frustrating when, I don't know, I hate that trope in general, not saying that this is that, where if someone would just use their words <laughs> and tell the other person something, all of the conflict would go yeah. away. I hate hate it when that happens but in this i can understand him one not necessarily wanting to burden or worry her with what's happening especially since he has no idea what it is himself in the past anytime that 
you know, something's come up, some sort of danger, and he's talked to her about it or addressed it with her, he knew exactly what the threat was. And at this point in time, I think it's a little unsettling for him that he's, you know, in the dark and doesn't also, actually have a hold on what's going on. He also knows that Buffy is trying to stay away from Angel. Mm -hmm. So the last thing she needs is to get the news that he's in trouble. Now, of course, she gets that news from elsewhere. And once yeah. Giles accepts that, the, the two of them are back to working together on it. But I, I, I understand his decision not to talk to her about it. Because, mm -hmm. you know... Well, we talked about how Buffy and Angel are both actually good at setting and, you know, respecting boundaries much better than any of the other Scoobies in this show. So I can definitely understand him. You know, if she doesn't want to see you, she doesn't want to see you. Angel's going to listen to that. Ugh, yeah. goodness. Well, he and Buffy had that awkward moment when they bumped into each other in town and oh. she's like shopping oh uh you're not shopping <laughs> and he sees a ghost Christmas and like runs really off yeah that's like one of my favorite <laughs> lines is you know joyce's they're decorating the tree and she's what did she say angel on top again angels on top again and <laughs> yes. buffy's just like buffy's what face. <laughs> <laughs> but you know i was like all right buffy we know what you're thinking about right now i I know this might come as a shock, but you don't have to put an angel or a star on top of your tree. No. I personally have Princess Leia at the top of my tree. I love that. This year I used the sorting hat from Harry Potter. Oh, that's awesome. To top it off. <laughs> so is your tree a Gryffindor, a Slytherin, a Hufflepuff, or a Ravenclaw? Did your tree get sorted? So my tree is very special because i am a, a ravendor this is so nerdy but <laughs> i have all representations of all the houses on my tree along with the hogwarts crest and my favorite characters with all of my other pop culture people people but the character ornaments i have are sorted into their houses near their oh house God. ornaments <laughs> on my tree <laughs> and awesome. the crest is in the middle i'll have to i don't think i took a picture yeah, of it yeah this year, but... let's put some pictures of that <laughs> on our instagram because that's awesome oh, i yeah. recently redid my tree and i actually took down all the nerdaments except for princess leia and yes. turned it into a i can't wait for spring tree and now oh, it is bedecked cool. in floral garlands so oh, like i'll put that, that up on the instagram as well I left um, my lights yeah. up. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of relevant because they're decorating for Christmas. But I think it's nice. You know, this is not a surprise or too big of a spoiler, I think, to mention this is the only Christmas episode of Buffy. Um, and that's yeah. kind of disappointing to me because I like it. I love holiday episodes. They do Halloween episodes so well. And... It's just, I don't know, there's just always something that feels a little special about it. And I don't love this one. So right. it would have been nice to have a couple other Christmas options out there. There's uh, my favorite of all of the special Christmas episode TV shows is The Supernatural Christmas. Oh, god! Which is called A Very Supernatural Christmas. And yes. it has to do with pagan gods and it's that is a fantastic it's extremely episode. funny and also really heart-wrenching the way that supernatural mm -hmm. is really good at doing again this is not a supernatural podcast but i assume <laughs> uh, we have a lot of overlap of supernatural yeah, there's fans probably with some fans. crossover yeah oh, uh, as long as we're on the subject of trees kelly did you do a tree this year i did but ours is just kind of a mishmash of different things i have been adding more i love vegas i go to vegas a lot and so Fun. each time i try and get an ornament and cool so I've, I've been collecting more and then like from like our zed head meetups i usually try and get something that's fun that oh like, like local or something from the where mm -hmm, the meetup is yeah that's a good idea while we're on the topic of christmas trees and and christmasy stuff I just wanted to take a minute to appreciate Joyce. You all know how much I love Joyce. 
and her very kind thought that faith is alone and that faith doesn't have a mother and wouldn't it be nice for her to spend Christmas, you know, with their family. And it's just, you know, it's Joyce who always, despite the, the drama and the supernatural stuff going on in Sunnydale, she's just a kind person and she continues to be a kind person all the time, but not too kind. Because when Buffy is like, what about Giles? She shuts it down so fast. <laughs> She's like, no. no. Eggnog with Giles around. Yeah. yeah. She's like, nope, that's nope. risky. Mm-mm. It's embarrassing. We're, we're both not ready for that. Like, <laughs> like the Buffy... fact that the last time they saw each other was on the hood of a cop car for the most part. <laughs> yeah. She's like, nope. No, no. No, no more Giles time. Uh, and Buffy <laughs> looks confused by that, but accepts it. And all right. later on, we'll find out more about that. I just, I just really enjoy any moment with Joyce and watching this show when I was in my twenties, I really didn't focus on Joyce much at all. Mm-hmm. And this time around, she's so important as the foundation of what makes Buffy special. I can't believe I didn't see it before that yeah. her just unswerving love and kindness for Buffy is the reason why Buffy can have love and compassion, even for demons and vampires, because she has this foundation of just unconditional love from her mother. And it's so beautiful to watch on screen. Mm -hmm. Joyce is a wonderful character and she grounds, she grounds the show in a special way. And I do like how she, you know she considers faith and encourages buffy to invite faith she's just a very she's just such a nurturing caring person and it it does make me sad thinking about you know if faith had had somebody like joyce in her life how different she would have been which obviously she would not be the same character on the show that we know and love but It's just so telling how much benefit Buffy derives from having Joyce as her mother. Like you were saying, it's she is the reason that Buffy is able to continue to have friendships and cultivate love and connections in her life. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I am going to be a stand for Joyce forever. And, you know, even though it was funny and fan candy, there is still a part of me that wishes Joyce and Giles would get together. Like, I I I don't 100% have it out of my system. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I mean, because it's sad. Like, they're both kind of alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and lovely people. And they they both parent Buffy. And And they would compliment each other. And in um in the uh, first episode or second episode of the season, you know, with the zombie mask and everything... They also have things in common, like interest in ancient artifacts. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways that it it seems like they would be a logical choice. And I think it's a good narrative choice not to give the audience like the most obvious story, Mm -hmm. but I still want it. I know. (laughs) It would have just been so much fun to see. Yeah. And then Buffy would have like her father figure and her mother. Yeah, all in one place. Yeah, because uh, screw Gosh. Buffy's uh, real father. Yeah, because where the <laughs> hell is he after season like two? <laughs> yeah, <gasps> Kelly, since you're our guest, where do you want to go from go next? Maybe talking about Angel's past. Like, yeah, good one. Good. good. And I feel silly. Like it did. It took until like this morning for me to realize that it's like ghosts of his past. You know, like christmas past like oh yeah that connection like yeah it's a little uh scroogey little yeah yeah Yeah. and i was trying to remember have we seen these characters before Mm -mm. okay no they're all brand new for this episode okay i think that that maid might come back in an angel episode i think so too i know she looked really familiar so i just couldn't remember if i was it's like just thinking past the, or future. Yeah. Sorry, I got I, a crew. The scene with the guy, the first one that was like yeah. the opening scene, 18 Daniel. something. 
Dublin at Christmas time. It took me mm-hmm. until my third watch to be like, oh, it's Christmas in Dublin and it's Christmas in London when he's in London. Duh. Mm-hmm. Um, so he chases this guy down in his vampire face. And then he's like, you owe me money from cards, like poker or something. So I'm going to mm-hmm. just kill you and eat you. And that's how I get, I'll take my winnings. It, mm-hmm. It's like classic evil angel, right? He's like oh, yeah. greedy. He's cruel. He thinks it's funny. He's all like, he's enjoying being evil. <laughs> he gets pleasure out of it. And this poor guy is like, I have a child and blah, blah, blah. You know, he's <laughs> he's just some poor guy. And it takes a minute because we're we've already after Angel has come back from hell and we see that he has his soul back, we're starting to fall in love with him again, right? The yeah. audience is like, Angel, oh, he suffers. Yeah. But seeing how evil he was is it's it makes the feeling of affection and compassion for him much more complicated. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, if he did that that one time, but he was a vampire for, you know, decades. Yeah. How yeah. many parents did he kill how many children mm-hmm. did he orphan or ch- we f- later find out when he talks to that one modern looking guy that he killed children and left them in their beds for their father to find like that is yeah, that's pretty dark. twisted dark that is dark pretty stuff twisted. and the curse is supposed to be tormenting him and so he thinks he deserves this oh yeah and he kind of does <laughs> yeah I'm like yeah well and it's it is very the parallels to a christmas story are just sprinkled everywhere throughout the entire episode and the promo which the original promo will link in the show notes and is posted to our instagram right now the opening of it it's you know it's got very dickensian imagery you see you know a carriage and people in the snow and people in top hats and walking along like an old london street and the struggles that you know ebenezer scrooge had in that particular narrative he was horrible to families destroying people basically for his own greed and pleasure which is what angel has been doing this entire time and we see that angelus as you know a vampire was violent or completely worthless basically just going after whoever he thought he could you know either get an easy i don't even know how to say it drink or eat from a meal <laughs> yeah. like with blood and then angel himself as a person we always saw as just kind of a you know a drunk that wasn't really amounting to much and right. angel Both before reflecting. before mm-hmm. he gets turned to a vampire and then after he gets his soul he spends a lot of time drinking and moping and not oh, yeah. accomplishing anything useful. It's not mm-hmm. until he decides to help Buffy that he gets his act together in any kind of serious way. And we can talk about this a little bit more in the spoilery section, but this episode has always kind of resonated almost as like an episode zero for the Angel mm-hmm. spinoff, like the yeah. very first prequel episode for angel as we see him you know dealing with the fact that he now feels like he needs to make amends for what he's done in the past and he needs to but only after buffy sort of presents the idea to him Mm -hmm. his his whole plan was to kill himself it's the coward's way out of having Mm -hmm. done horrible things is to just take yourself out of the equation rather than trying to make up for it atone for it be accountable for it i mean he can't go back and give these people their lives back and he will never ever make up for that but buffy's right he he can do good and he shouldn't Mm -hmm. just give up instead of doing good and then you know obviously the trajectory that he takes and what leads to the development of his own show is 
without being too spoilery, it has a lot to do with doing good, making those amends, and attempting to, you know, be worthwhile after the worthlessness in his prior life as a human and the violence and harm he caused as Angelus as a vampire. But watching him struggle during this episode, he's just so low and i think it's very appropriate that it's a christmas seasonal episode because of how depression really seems to hit hard for you know a lot of people during the holidays and that feeling of being you know worthless and it'd be better off if i just wasn't here and all of that you can really see in angel and even and with the deep the f- loneliness, deep, deep yes. loneliness yeah. and not being able to forgive himself. And with, with the appearance of Jenny as the first evil, that's kind of his, almost his internal voice. If you're looking at it through a, a metaphor with depression that she's good at, you know, the first evil is good at manipulating and convincing angel that he has absolutely nothing left to give at this point and that just i could not stop thinking about the parallels to depression especially in his interactions with her she just kind of subtly pushes him and pushes him until he feels so overwhelmed by what he's done in the past and like there is literally no way for him to escape what he's done or you know rectify it so at that point he's just ready to stand out in the sun and off himself and Buffy kind of comes and reminds him of his purpose and that he can still add value and it just I don't know it made me it hit different this this time for some this reason this has never been one of my favorite episodes and so I hadn't watched it in a really long time. I, I usually skip it. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out why I don't like it that much. And I think part of it is that I found the first to be kind of confusing and ambiguous as a villain. And I was yeah. like, this is dumb. That's dumb. So I just didn't like it. And then yeah. I I also think it's got a very different pace and feel from a lot of other episodes. When I was making my notes and collecting sound bites, I noticed there's lots of monologues. There's not a lot of dialogue in the episode. It's a lot of long speeches by different characters. And it's just a different pace from other Buffy episodes. It's got a whole different feel about it. And I, you know, I think I just didn't, I didn't love it. So I would just skip over it, but it's so important for Angel's story going forward. I, I of course took some sound clips, so I thought Mm -hmm. we could, um, I want to go back to Angel's past and talk about the maid and how he, you know, the thing with the guy was, was money, right? He was like, you, Mm -hmm. you owe me money and you, you owe me. So I'm going to take my winnings with the maid it was more like rape. And, you know, he says all the things to her that are based, he just takes advantage of her class. You know, he's like, your mistress isn't going to believe you. Yeah, go ahead and cry out. They'll fire you and you'll be out of work. And now fired is better than dead. She should have made that decision. But at the time, she just thought Angel was human and he was going to rape her, not eat her. And so she didn't call out. But he used her situation against her the way many sexual predators do. They pick people who are in positions of vulnerability and threaten their safety, their livelihood, their family. And they get, you know, a version of consent by doing that by, by, you know, using fear and manipulation. And, and this was up right up until the bite. This was a, a very real world situation that was going on. And it was in this crowded, lively party just off in the corner. And this woman had nowhere to turn and no way to get help. It 
really made me grateful to have been born in the 20th century and after the time period when women could vote and have jobs and bank accounts and things like that. I felt so bad for this poor maid and she just didn't have any good options. It sucked. And then, you know, she comes back to, to Angel in the for you know, the first takes her form and really lays it out for him. But you see... That's what makes you different than other beasts. They kill to feed. But you took more kinds of pleasure in it than any creature that walks or crawls. Oh, God. Yeah. Cry out. Oh. Make a scene. I was to be married that week. But then, as I recall, you knew that? It wasn't me. It wasn't you? A demon isn't a man. I was a man once. Oh, yes. And what a man you were. I love that moment of levity when it cuts to him. And it's just a couple of seconds of screen time, just showing that Angel is, before he was Angel, he was also a worthless person. It's creepy. Do you think about, like, who would be the ghosts of Christmas past that would visit you? Like, I have never murdered anybody, (laughs) but there are certainly people who I have wronged in my past or hurt. And I... I, yeah. I wonder what it would be like if they came and like haunted me and, and told me what a horrible person I was. I, maybe I would be willing to kill myself as well at the end of that. I don't know. That doesn't sound like a no. fun experience to have. <laughs> but I do, I love the the dream device that they use with Buffy and Angel kind of, you know, meeting up in their dreams. Because we've seen Buffy have somewhat prophetic mm-hmm. dreams before. And there's always been this interest in them. And the fact that she sees him in that situation with, I believe it's Margaret, Margaret, who is the maid, is just the fact that Buffy witnesses him, what appears to be almost commit a sexual assault and then a murder, has got to hit hard because... You know, she has seen what she thought as her angel mm-hmm. has been back and she was feeling for him again. And that's why she knew she needed to have that distance and then to be pulled into a dream and see him behaving like that must have just been super Gosh, painful not very christmassy no. yeah like not not inducive to any sort of christmas spirit and angel i'm assuming i mean i think it reads kind of all over his face feels that shame at buffy seeing him like this after the initial shock of seeing buffy in his dream just there's no way he wants her to see him that way and that probably just digs him further into the trenches of this you know kind of depressive episode and he's like well now buffy knows who i really am on top of everything else like she's seen what i've put her through with her friends with jenny calendar and then seeing this side of him as well it just it was an impactful choice i think to have that being the murder that she specifically witnesses what do you think caused buffy to go into Angel's dream. Do you think there was an external force that made that happen? Yeah, I was thinking about that and I part of me thinks it has to do with the first and somehow thinking that if you know the first shows Buffy this side of Angel and makes it feel so real that it might isolate Buffy further from Angel or drive her further away and convince Angel to, you know, truly kill himself or end up killing Buffy and creating some sort of conflict like the first seems to, you know, want to drive him towards. But I don't know. I also wonder if it could just be like this quirky Slayer ability that Buffy seems to have where she has this deep connection with Angel and that tie allows her you know kind of prophetic dream abilities to sync up with him it's a cool power but it would be very disturbing I think to be in other people's dreams can you imagine 
uh-huh. like the weird right? stuff you would see. I would not. Yeah. I would not enjoy that. I don't think. <laughs> My dreams are weird enough. I don't need. <laughs> it's really hard to understand the first and what the first agenda is and we're gonna have to talk a lot more about this in spoilers because there's there's information from mm-hmm. future stuff that will will bear on this but just within the context of this episode what we learn about the first is that it is somehow related to these high priests, the bringers, and the bringers chant. And and it's unclear to me if the first controls the bringers or the bringers somehow control the first. Because the first speaks as if it is in charge and it has an agenda for Angel. It, it takes credit for ta- bringing Angel back from the hell dimension. And it says that it has a plan. It also refers to itself as we. It's like, we brought you back. And so I'm like, who else is we? Who's in the we? Right? It's it's frustrating not to know what that is. It's very, you know, woo-woo, magic, yeah. powerful people thing. I remember being very <laughs> confused by that the first time yeah. around. It's super confusing. And maybe not until the third or fourth time around, after having watched Angel, did it really start to click you know what they never show in this in in buffy is giles adding information to the resources where they find out information that's like partially true or you know points them in a slightly wrong direction like they learned a lot about the first and the bringers from this and like did he write it down we assume that's what the watcher's diaries are right I, I don't know how they disseminate I, that information so. to other people on the Watcher's Council. Is it only in ancient <laughs> books that he gets information? Like, there's no there's no information from, you know, the 20th century onward that's been published. I, I, I'm sort of, I always wanted there to be a Watcher's Council spinoff because I wanted to know all about yeah. how they, Beautiful. what else they do? What are they up to? They can't have only one Slayer that they're all yeah. focused on. They clearly do other kinds of research and training and and have other you know agents that they work with so i I never felt satisfied that we got enough information about the watchers Mm -hmm. council and and how they do Mm -hmm. things but i did i would like to see giles like at some point being like oh we have to correct that in the books that's not (laughs) how that happened because uh it it sounded like the bringers bring the first and point it at a person from the research, right? So the theory being the bringers wanted the first to go after Angel and they pointed him towards Angel for reasons we don't know. But then the first makes it sound like it wanted to go after Angel. It has all the power and the bringers are just sort of like support staff. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's what it seems. It's unclear to me. It's almost like I saw it as almost like the first is like the cult leader of the yeah of the priest yeah and so they're doing what they or well, and, like you know they're just doing what they can to summon this evil back. That's what's confusing too is but what why? the first motivation is because it seems like you know there's this motivation to turn angel back to mm-hmm. you know evil and jealous again and kind of a push towards possibly killing buffy but then didn't care if he was mm-hmm. gonna off himself yeah. so it's like is it just the purpose is is it just to wreak right is it just and chaos? create this chaos or you know what what is actually yeah because when that because when angel says he's gonna kill himself the first says oh that wasn't the plan but it'll work and i'm like so is yeah. the ultimate plan just to wound buffy because Maybe. whatever happens here almost certainly was gonna hurt buffy all the different outcomes that That's the first true. was pushing for was gonna really really hurt yeah. her and and you know it's corny but at the end buffy is is so vulnerable and and says that she loves angel even though she knows all this horrible stuff that he's done and and she's Mm -hmm. like i wish i didn't love you i i have that the speech it's really 
incredibly moving to me. Yeah. Her faces. Am I a thing worth saving, huh? Am I a righteous man? The world wants me gone. What about me? I love you so much. And I tried to make you go away. I killed you and it didn't help. And I hate it. I hate that it's so hard. And that you can hurt me so much. I know everything that you did because you did it to me. God, I wish that I wished you dead. I don't. The pain in her voice is so visceral. And I love that she delivers yeah. that speech actually fairly quietly. She's not yelling this at him. Yeah. She's just, it's its being wrenched out of her by the pain of, of the idea of him dying. It's intense. Um, yeah. But they don't have Buffy's declaration of love to Angel be the thing that saves him. You know, what saves him is the snow. And the snow is clearly yeah. supernatural in origin. And he and Buffy both seem to take mm -hmm. it as a sign that some good power or the world, as he talks about, wants him to stay alive. It's interesting to me. I'm like, why do you think snow is good? Like snow could come like just because it's white. <laughs> that's kind of racist. Like I, I wasn't sure what, like, why snow. It definitely means that there is a power that wants Angel not to kill himself. But beyond that, like we don't know what that power is and whether or not that power is something we should be listening to. But you know, the two of them mm -hmm. want so badly to be together that they interpret it that way. Yeah, and I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily blame them for wanting a little bit of optimism after what they've dealt with and you think about to christmas time the holidays in sunnydale it's never snowed snow seems like this magical blessing almost and i just you know the way that they want to be together they love each other and this momentarily saves angel's life I don't think they want to go any further in any sort of critical thinking about what could have actually caused that snow and how, you know, odd it is that even if there's snow, the sun still shines a lot of the time. Yeah. So they don't question anything at all about it. And part, I always wonder what was intentional and what was planned at this point. Oh, you mean in terms of where the story but, eventually ends up? Yeah. Spoilers. Spoilers. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about it at the yeah. end. <laughs> yep. I was like, I won't say anything more than that. <laughs> let's, let's take a little detour and talk about the Oz and Willow storyline. <laughs> And, and where those two start at the beginning of the episode and end up at the end. I like that conflict resolution in this particular relationship took time, that there were several episodes of mm -hmm. them being apart. And one of my pet peeves on TV shows is that characters never seem to ever take the option of let's let's think about it for a minute before we make a decision. Everything has to be urgent. And I get it. It's like dramatic for narrative that you move from point to point to point, action to action to action. But it is nice to yeah. see sometimes that Oz was like, I need to think about it. And the show let him go think about it for a little while. And then they have a conversation about how he needed to think about it and what he's concluded after he thought about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's, Thank you for modeling a conflict resolution style that makes sense and works. Right. Like sometimes people, I am one of those people, mm -hmm. need to process slowly and without new information mm -hmm. for a little bit before we can figure out what we want in a situation or a relationship. So thank you, creators, yeah. for giving me this 
this whole Oz arc that I identify with so closely. It's just more Oz being kind of perfect. Yeah. He's a little too perfect, though. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is. He's pretty ideal. It bothers me that there's not an equivalent to, like, a Mary Sue. For men. For male characters. But at this point, Oz is it. Maybe we should start it and call it, like, like Mark Sue. Or or, or (laughs) call it an Oz and say, like, this is what it is when a male character has no flaws. Yeah. Because he just, he's even understanding about her. She's like wanting to have sex with him and makes it clear that she's willing to have sex with him. And teenage boy Oz is like, no, you know what? (laughs) Like, this is not right. We need to wait. And he's very understanding and mature in that conversation with her. That seems so cute. It is so cute. (laughs) It really is. And she can't even say, you know, yeah. sex. She yeah. can't actually voice. And it's like, usually that's a good sign that you're yeah. not ready <laughs> to engage in that activity. It's a repeat of, but, the, of the scene from Innocence in season two. It's it's like the next version mm-hmm. of it when she's like, want to make out? And he's like, mm-hmm. when I'm kissing you in my fantasy, you're kissing me. It's not because you want to you know, get back at Xander. And again, he's like, yeah. when when we do have sex, I want us to both want to do it for the same reasons and not because you're trying to prove something to me. It's almost yep. superhumanly mature mm-hmm. from Oz. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I also yeah. appreciate a storyline that was being told in the 90s of a straight young man who wasn't just like ravenous and uncontrollable when it comes to sex. Like, thank you. Yeah. Not all men are like that, it's and nice. not all women are like, "Oh, I'm not ready." Like it, mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. variety is nice. It's a nice little foil to Xander in a yeah. lot of ways. I feel like most of Xander's motivation is sex based. I think most of Xander's m- motivation is insecurity based, and he wants yeah. to be validated, and sex or <laughs> women's attention is like like the ultimate validation he's not going to get academic validation like willow Mm -hmm. felt unpopular and and unloved also but she was getting a lot of external validation for being smart and a good student and all that stuff xander wasn't even getting that this whole time and we see like he's sleeping outside on christmas because his family is a nightmare I also was like, why didn't Buffy and yeah. Joyce invite Xander over? Yeah. And Buffy knows he's alone on Christmas and sleeping outside on the ground. Like, it's like basically to escape his abusive family situation. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it. I do like how it gives us more insight to why Xander is the way he is and why he may behave the way he does sometimes. Because if he is not getting, like you said, any sort of validation at home, any sort of support at home, then, you know, I do yeah. feel bad for him. Like, that's that's hard to navigate being a teenager. And even Willow, you know, we have references to her parents being around, even if they're, you know, uh-huh. leaving her alone for a couple of days here and there. <laughs> but Xander doesn't have any indication that he has a stable adult figure in his life and the one that we see him with giles seems to not like him very much yeah yeah, really (laughs) dislike him and just dismiss him most of the time so i can understand where his need for validation comes from It just doesn't really make it any less frustrating to see in action. But it would have been nice for Joyce and Buffy to reach out to Xander, too. I think his, like, he uses his sarcasm and comedy as a defense mechanism. Very much, yeah. And and it's inappropriate most times, but he'll get a laugh, I'm sure. And that's that's validation, too, right? It's, like, for attention and and Mm -hmm. for some kind of positive reaffirmation of himself as a human it's a theme that's going to come up with xander again is his feeling like he's not 
seen Mm -hmm. or valued as a person. And I can get it if you have Mm -hmm. a crappy home life and a crappy school life and demons are real. Like, uh, (laughs) you know, and and your your two best friends have superpowers and you don't. Like, I would feel invisible (laughs) and like a loser also. But yeah, yeah, it doesn't make the things he says about women and the homophobia any less problematic. It just makes it more understandable. Yeah. I guess it's yeah. fairly realistic there writing is... and I should respect that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it is mm-hmm. realistic, but there is one of my absolute favorite Xander moments in this episode when he goes with Buffy to the, you know, underground bar scene and talks to willie and tries to be you know intimidating and get information out of him and i love how willie gives him that validation he's like yeah good job kid you're very intimidating yeah. like, really? and xander's just like really it's like it's great and then he says does it, i think he says something like yeah merry christmas kid or something afterwards and it's just such this bizarre but pure exchange and it gives xander the sense of like i helped yeah. Like, I did something. And it's nice to see that for him. Like, I'm glad he has that moment. But it also tells you just how much that's lacking everywhere else right. in that his he gets life. And I, significant I, validation I, from a demon bartender <laughs> is, is, yeah, he's desperate yeah. for validation and attention. Yeah. Uh, I love everything it's about just- that bar. I love Willie. <laughs> I love the whole concept that there's yeah. like a bar in Sunnydale that Buffy goes to occasionally <laughs> to get oh, information. Slayer. And then and that Willie is oh, like, God. oh, the Slayer! Really loud. <laughs> so that <laughs> his clientele yeah. can like quietly get up and leave. <laughs> is adorable. It's just, it's so good. It adds mm-hmm. such a fun layer to you know, the mythology of this show. And Willie, you know, Willie's got to look out for his business. And I like how there's still like one patron (laughs) hanging around who either just like does not give a crap that Buffy's the slayer. And it's like, eh, I'm here. Yeah. Stay here. Like, and Buffy usually is pretty good, you know, at leaving things be as long as they're not doing anything crazy or hurting anyone. But Xander, good old Xander gets to experience some (laughs) positive feedback and it makes me happy every time I see it. Yeah. I would very much enjoy a spinoff about Willie's bar as well. (laughs) Like how did Willie get into that business? Maybe not a whole spinoff, but but like exactly an episode. (laughs) Yeah. What's behind the bar? What's on tap? Is there blood back there? Is it demon entry? Is it like entrails? Is it, weird creepers or do <laughs> or do demons eat human food like is it like french fries and chicken sandwiches who knows uh yeah not a whole series about when, willie but in, like people. like one deep dive episode with willie would have been pretty fun that would have been fun well you know in other vampire franchises it seems like vampires aren't able to really eat or enjoy human food and i'm trying to remember now don't we see spike eating we see lo- plenty of vampires drinking soda or eating fast food and, and booze like yeah plenty of in... booze in, in the yeah vampires. um there is in the future some confirmation that spike likes fried food that's right so <laughs> in this universe i think vampires can eat i know in twilight I kind of like makes it. Them eat, like pretending to eat food in Twilight is a really big deal. It makes them really uncomfortable, yeah. whatever that it's means. Like dirt. Uh, their body can't digest like it or whatever. Um, it's unclear. Which makes sense because they're dead. <laughs> but, you know. I mean, as much as anything makes sense fun. in a vampire universe. I know. I remember there was one time... I, I had not read Twilight, and one of my friends brought something up about killing vampires by 
ripping their heads off or lighting them on fire. I was like, that's not true. They have to have a stake through the heart. And I was like, that is entirely yeah. fiction. <laughs> and the fact that it came out of my mouth is like, no, no, no. Buffy was yeah. clearly deep in my subconscious. Right. Both versions are fiction. And that, and <laughs> if you're out there and you're writing a vampire story, you can make it that, you know, only plastic <laughs> weapons kill them or that, you know, you will, you kill them by disemboweling them or I don't know. I will say there was another point that I did want to make about Xander that I thought was a pretty big st- step for him was in the first place offering to help Buffy and Giles look into what was going on with Angel and obviously you know it's not because he cares about Angel or likes Angel but it is an actual selfless thing to do to support his friend Mm -hmm. Buffy in this point in time and help figure out what the hell's going on and i think yes it helps all of them to know what's going on with angel but xander didn't have to have anything to do with it he could have you know declined so i did think it was a little sign of growth that he volunteered to help out when there's nothing really in it for him nothing motivating him other than to just help out yeah and that's it. one of my favorite moments is when he hops mm-hmm. out and he's like then we'll help him yeah so and once nice. he agrees to help him mm-hmm. we don't see any more snark from xander the rest of the episode mm-hmm. so it is kind of a beautiful show of of loyalty that he even puts the joking on hold because he can see how affected buffy is by what's going on and how scary it is for her yeah empathy yeah it is it's growth it's learning for him and it is a it is a great moment one of the ghosts of christmas past that that haunts angel is the man whose children angel killed and left in their beds and what's really interesting to me about that is that the guy is wearing what looks like a fairly modern like business Mm -hmm. suit this is this is like post Mm -hmm. 70s maybe so mm-hmm. we know Angel was cursed in the late 19th century. So this 20th century guy whose kids were left in their beds for him to find, that happened after Angel had his soul returned. That's awful. Yeah, it made me wonder like, if, if it happened <sighs> when after him and Buffy. No, that's trying, what like, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's if it was during that I period had, when he was Angelus but, again. Yeah. Yeah. And something else, you know, this, the last time he had quote unquote been under the influence of the demon, like evil, he went out and did more of that. Okay. That fun. makes more sense to me. Thank you. I'm glad I brought it up. Yeah. Cause it threw me off at first. I was like, wait a second. I'm like, oh, okay. So if he was just being overall, and he was, he was on a tear as Angelus. Mm-hmm. So I could see that happening. Kara's dog is very verklempt about the situation. I, oh. <laughs> yeah, he's he's fifteen and he's very upset that I'm not giving him attention. And where I usually record is under construction right now, so I'm just hopeful that he's not he's not too bad. Although his whining does seem very on theme with this episode, it is a pretty melodramatic and yeah intense one i just a a little side note i thought that the choice of silent night being sung by carolers in the background of the scene when angel is chasing the first victim we see through the snow was extra creepy the the singing was was just soft enough and slow enough to add to the tension of the scene and it was I haven't seen Christmas Carol be so creepy in a while and I I just loved it. I'm so here for that kind of thing. That's yeah. it's an aesthetic that appeals to it me. It's nice. Well, there are certain songs that are kind of upbeat and I don't know, innocent sounding on first glance <laughs> that 
because of their usage in different horror franchises, I now get creeped out immediately when I hear them. And this, after hearing Silent Night in this context, I was like, that's, yeah, that's why I always have somewhat of an eerie feeling. That and that tiptoe. Oh, that song is creepy anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But it was used just to great effect on Walking Dead and it, yeah. It's like traumatic now for every yep. Walking Dead viewer. Yep. <laughs> that and, and Insidious. Oh, I haven't seen Insidious. It's yeah. just... Oh, gosh. I love that fridge. I don't know why I do it to myself because every time I watch one of those movies, I cannot sleep without a light on <laughs> afterwards. But it's it's pretty fantastic. But they do a good job in Buffy of you know the score and the music choices alone always add to everything and it's subtle enough where it's not distracting and i just every choice that they make in this show is so well thought out and intentional and impactful i also will say that i enjoy the sound editing on this show it seems to do what i think sound editing for tv should do which is make sure that the dialogue is always audible so many shows Mm -hmm. i feel like lately when i watch tv so many shows i need subtitles for because the the sound mix means that you have to have the tv all the way up to hear the volume Mm -hmm. and then it's way too loud when there's action or the music overpowers the dialogue and i was really starting to think that it was me getting older and my ears not working as well. But rewatching mm-hmm. Buffy, I'm like, no, I can hear everything they're saying on this show. Yeah. So it's a sound mix. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did. There, there are a couple of before getting into small notes. I did want to talk a little bit more about mm-hmm. faith in this episode. So you know, Buffy tells Joyce that she and Faith haven't really been talking or even making eye contact so i take that to mean ever since revelations after their Mm -hmm. giant fight and buffy goes to her hotel room the next day there's just nothing faith has been keeping away from them she's still obviously hurt but the fact that buffy goes and reaches out to her and faith first pretends that there's this party she's going to is one of those moments where I'm like, damn it, Faith, accept it. Like, just open yourself up a little bit more again and, you know, go. And I love when she shows up on Buffy's doorstep with her little, you know, attempt at presence. And she's still hanging up little Christmas lights in her motel room. And it's just, I don't know. It's a nice moment to see her actually give in again and go with Joyce and Buffy. And I just I wish we had a little bit more of it and yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It it always hits me that the friendship Buffy and Faith could have had would have been a great one and the positive impact that Buffy and Joyce could have on Faith. And I'm, you know, anything else will be too yeah. spoilery, but I do enjoy when she finally shows up it makes me happy every time that she's willing to open herself up again and clearly still wants that connection and you know i like that buffy actually did what her mother suggested too and extended that olive branch and extended the invitation because she definitely didn't have to she could have let faith sulk but i think it says a lot about buffy's character that she still has gone to reach out to Faith. And Faith I wish has... we knew what her presents were. What Faith's uh, yeah, she's like, they're know. crappy. They're crappy. She keeps saying they're crappy. But uh, it reminds <laughs> me of this one year when um, my brother was working at Store 24 and all of us got our presents from Store 24. <laughs> and it was... Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't have a lot of money at the time and it was fine. Like, I don't, I don't need a lot of money to be spent on my gifts, but there's a, it's a limited selection of inventory at store 24. So Mm -hmm. I got a mug and, um, I think my other brother got like 
ignition fluid or something like for his car (laughs) (laughs) there was definitely chocolate somebody got chocolate like it was just you know stuff you could buy at a convenience store and so that faith moment always reminds me of of my brother and how how sweet that was that one year I think he was a college student that's so sweet and he was working at store 24 over Christmas break and he was also working night shifts and uh, it was just a really hard time for him but you know, he still found he still found a way to give us presents. And I had that mug. That's it was a Darth sweet. Vader mug for a really long time until it got broken in one of my moves. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh man. Oh and I love when Faith steps out with Joyce mm-hmm. to look at the snow. I forgot about that scene. That scene, she just looks so yeah. happy. And it's such a nice moment. Oh, yeah. Rudy. The snow scene in general um, is really nice. How we like revisit, we see most of our characters mm-hmm. realizing it's snowing. I don't know why we don't get to see Xander. Giles, but we see yeah Xander uh, in the yeah. sleeping bag <laughs> outside in the cold. Poor guy. And we, we also have not talked about Buffy's oh, hair. Yeah. Oh, oh, the bang! Like, <laughs> and it. Like, like me. Well, and it changes Every like one time. thing they're teeny tiny and then the next yes! thing that looks like they're long and pulled over i'm like what is going on i think i have like, like three notes about her bangs like when i was yeah. watching well and that scene where she's pouring her heart out <laughs> to angel about how much he means to her i do get distracted <laughs> by her bangs sometime in that scene i was like i this might be the worst hair <laughs> Buffy. Yeah, has. I think it's the worst of the whole series for Buffy's hair. It's, <laughs> it's pretty bad. I also would like to know why when she goes looking for the bringers and then for Angel, she has a coat on since it's yes. like a heat wave in Sunnydale. Like it I, makes mm-hmm. sense at the end mm-hmm. with the snow, but I know I have that. that down. They're all wearing coats. Like Faith shows up, she's wearing a coat, and they're like, <laughs> "It's so hot, we need to turn on the AC." And then yeah. It's got to feel Christmassy. They have to have coats yeah, on. That it's a lot of times um, the characters on the show, especially Buffy, is wearing a fabulous coat, and I'm always like, "It's Southern California. Like yeah. how hot? How cold is it?" That that a I that she's so. wearing a coat in a lot of scenes, but also like that she owns like thirty gorgeous <laughs> different coats. Like I live in Boston. I have several different winter coats because winter lasts like six months here. Yeah. You but actually in need Southern them. California, you need a coat like sometimes at night. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or when you go skiing, I guess. And like, an angel has one on, and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, well, what? vampires can't feel temperature, so his yeah. is purely a style choice. Yeah, <laughs> which is how you know that Angel is a little bit vain because he cares about fashion. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, and angel. his. Except for that one time he was in beige. That was he wore beige. Ugh. Yeah, it was like that beige pants and a white shirt. Mm. Uh, I think it was either in. I think it was sometime in season two. I think we talked about it because it was so weird, <laughs> jarring to see him <laughs> that way. And I bet the wardrobe department was like, "Oh, all right, not that doing that work. again, never yeah. again." And then also, like, mm-hmm. does he sleep nude? Like. It's- <laughs> Because it seemed like Seems he did. Like yeah, maybe. Like, why? like, what sense does that make? I don't know. I guess do what you want, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people practice. sleep nude. I guess that's yeah. fine. Uh, he does seem to have acquired yeah. clothes, though. You know, when he came back from hell, the mansion mm-hmm. was empty, and he was naked, yeah. and he now he has clothes <laughs> and furniture and, like, serious decor in his house. There's stuff hanging on the walls. There's, like, sculptures on top of tables. There's mirrors, even though he's a vampire. Why are there mirrors? Like, he's decorated. No, I was just thinking, I'm just imagining him stealing all of that stuff. Because where is he getting it from? I don't think he has a wallet. He doesn't have a credit card. Yeah. And money. Uh, yeah. Kelly, what were you going to say? Well, speaking of things on walls, like, did you guys, maybe you even talked about it in another episode. The thing on Giles' wall. The creepy, like, drawing, like... <laughs> It almost looks like a kid mm-hmm. drew it, but it's like oh, a I didn't notice it. Oh no, I have to go yeah. back and look. I yeah, I, I, I have a pic. I took a picture. I'll send it to you guys. Later. Oh, awesome! But- Creepy. A lot of times, it's fun with this show, especially in season four. The 
to pause and look at stuff in the background. The art department goes to a lot of mm-hmm. trouble with the like stickers and band posters and and when they get to college, like all the yeah. college flyers and oh, banners yeah. and things like that that are on campus are always really, really fun to look at. There's little Easter eggs in there. Like fantastic. that one time the poster behind Buffy said, normal women or normal girls don't fall in love with dead men or something like that. <laughs> yeah just a little little dig there at Buffy's love life Uh, (laughs) I mean she's the slayer like who's she supposed to fall in love with that her life is so complicated seriously she can't like Giles is too old for her she can't go that that's so disturbing to even think about but I was like, who are available men to Buffy who would understand what she's dealing with? Yeah. It's like a watcher Xander or, or Xander. Yeah. 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 yeah not yeah. great. Options. Or vampires. Yeah. Ooh. She doesn't have a lot of options that are reasonable. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people on the Gosh. internet who have very strong feelings about who Buffy should be with. But I oh, yeah. have always felt like none of the men she's connected with on the show are the right person for her they're just part of her journey Mm -hmm. i've never felt like she belonged like forever with any of the men that she's Mm -hmm. been involved with Mm -hmm. that's how i felt about rory on gilmore girls yeah i didn't like it really any of her boyfriends (laughs) i was like they all kind of suck in their own ways they're they're not compatible it's the same thing with buffy i think each of them has a very important lesson Mm -hmm. for her and she learns a lot, but I don't see her with any of them long term. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's also good storytelling. You don't want to make your characters too happy or give them yeah. the happily ever after until the very end of a series. And it gets boring, right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's not true. fun. That's why the will they, they won't they of. Do you remember Moonlighting, the show Moonlighting? Mm-hmm. That's the first yep. show I remember being built around a will they won't they dynamic and it was the Mm -hmm. whole energy of the show for years Mm -hmm. and then they get the couple together and the show tanked after that and so I think a lot of creative people people in tv and movies were like oh well don't get (laughs) don't let people get together that's Mm -hmm. never gonna work and it's a, it always comes down to if you write it well, you can make it work. If you want to, mm-hmm. you can write it to make it yeah. work. There can be tension in yeah. other ways. One of my least favorite examples of that, this is a very small tangent, is on The Office when they had Pam all of a sudden kind of flirting with the mic guy to create this issue in her and Jim's marriage. And I was just like, this was not necessary. You don't need to go there. Yeah. Women but, characters can have conflicts that are not relationship, like love, sex mm-hmm. based, and I think it's that. it's getting a lot better in our media. But there was a time when that was just the only way to make a a female character interesting was either to mess with her love life or have a dangerous pregnancy, like that seemed to be mm-hmm. the storylines, yeah. or or yeah. get raped. Yeah, right. Those were the ways that women yeah. characters had conflict mm-hmm. and. It, it's getting better and and we're seeing more interesting developments for characters and problems and characters relationships that aren't just a love triangle like you, i get tired of love triangles it's like yeah that's that's not the only yeah, reason that a true. relationship can have friction is that there's another person <laughs> yeah. right you, you can create plenty of conflict just the two of you like believe me mm-hmm. <laughs> I wrote down Faith is probably lying about there being a party at all. She doesn't want to need anybody. Right. I mean, a person who has been, we talk a lot about PTSD, a person who has had mm-hmm. several people abandon them or has never had a stable, loving home desperately wants it and also fears it because they know that if they start to feel safe with someone that person then has the power to hurt them deeply and so it's a constant come close go away push and pull for somebody who's had that kind of trauma in their life and you know we don't know all the stories about what happened to faith as a child but it it sure doesn't sound from what we do know like she had a loving 
stable home life and that, you know, she got her emotional needs met as a child. So she's, she's constantly in a state of come close, go away with, with Buffy and the rest of the Scoobies. And she's already been hurt. She got really, really hurt by them in revelations. And it's a big deal that she comes to their house for Christmas and, and sort of, you know, transparently lies about the party being a drag as an excuse to be there. I remember, I don't know if it was, another Buffy podcast that I've listened to at some point, or if it was a YouTube video or what, but there were, I remember hearing a take on this episode about, you know, not understanding why Faith was so upset or why she even got so hurt in revelations. And I was like, that is central to Faith's (laughs) character that like why she got so upset and hurt being left out. Because the way that she's grown up, that is, you know, that fear of abandonment, that abandonment wound is huge for her. And it just motivates her entire character. And I remember saying they're yelling back at people talking. I was like, no, this is important. You have to understand this. But it's just, I don't know. It's nice to see her have a moment of connection and actual happiness and inclusion in this episode. It's just kind of refreshing. Yeah. Okay. I think we've had enough fun playing in the snow and I just now realized that it's a snow angel episode. That's funny. And let's get into (laughs) trivia. Our first piece of trivia, Kara already alluded to this, but this is the only Christmas episode in the show's run. The eyeless bringers in black robes, which return in season seven, are a nod to the Devil's Reign, 1975, which features acolytes of a satanic cult in the same look. Yeah, I tried to look up like the runes that are on their eyes, but I didn't have much luck with it. Oh, yeah. And as mentioned earlier, this episode is the only Christmas episode in the show's run. And we shared a flyer on our Instagram a few days ago that was representative of a sweepstakes that was ongoing during this time by the WB. And it was a Buffy Christmas sweepstakes where you could call (laughs) 1-800-COLLECT and basically try to win a role on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And they used this as an episode for, or as an advertisement for the episode Amends. And there was a specific commercial that they played for this contest as an additional kind of preview and promo for Amends with Sarah Michelle Gellar and David Boreanaz as Buffy and Angel, and it immediately aired right after the episode of Lover's Walk. And I think I found a YouTube video of it that we can share on our Instagram account and on Facebook, but it's just (laughs) such a fascinating (laughs) commercial. And it's, it's snowing in, you know, Sunnydale and as we see Buffy walk down the streets you hear this voice over this season with 1-800-COLLECT you don't have to be alone for the holidays <laughs> and Buffy stops by a payphone and starts to call and that's how they let you know that this is how you can enter the sweepstakes so it's a lovely bit of nostalgia at the same time so we'll post that it's 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 a fun that's watch. hilarious I have been loving the old uh promos for the episodes that you have been finding and posting they're so sensationalist and over the top and and goofy it's really nostalgic it's like these this type of promo is probably why a lot of people did not give (laughs) buffy a chance at the time it was they're really cheesy (laughs) it makes it look like the show is a lot more shallow than it is Uh, oh, this yeah. episode amends oh, had gosh. at least two other titles before JW decided what to call it. It was called Old Enemies, Dead Enemies, and A Buffy Christmas. I'm glad they didn't go with Old Enemies or Dead Enemies because there's yeah. an episode in a couple of weeks yeah. that's called Enemies, and it's a really good name yeah. for that episode. Yeah, much more appropriate there. All right. 
We're reaching that part of the episode of the podcast where I ask you the question, does it still slay? Kelly, you're up first. I think it does. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was actually, I was disappointed because I was sick a couple weeks ago and couldn't come on for Revelations, but I think I actually like this mm-hmm. episode better than Revelations. Excellent. Up, nice. That yeah, worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, why do you think you like it better than Revelations? I, I didn't like the Watcher character in Revelations. Like, she oh. just bothered me a lot. So, oh, yes. Gwendolyn Mrs. Ghost. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it just seemed like a cheesier episode. I mean, this was cheesy in parts, but I don't know. I just... This one was more about the relationships, I guess. Well, that image of her with yeah. the glove on and the <laughs> lightning come down is kind yeah. of <laughs> comical. Yeah. Yeah. Kara, do you, does it still slay yeah. for you? Yeah, you know, I think I might still continue to skip this in a rewatch, honestly. But I enjoy it because of the implications it has for further on in the series of Buffy and further on with Angel. I just, I don't really enjoy Angel being tormented. Um, It was a little confusing the first time around, but it's, you know, it's an episode of Buffy, so it's still enjoyable. It's just not one of my favorites. (laughs) I would say that it slays for me personally more now than it did before. I got a lot more out of it than I used to. I think at the time, the gloominess of it and all the monologues just really were a downer and it's not what I wanted. And so I just kept skipping it. But now that I've seen all of Buffy and all of Angel, like you said, the implications for mm-hmm. for how this relates to some future episodes that we'll talk about in the spoiler section make it a lot more interesting. So. That Willie scene kind of saves it for me. Yeah, too. I love Willie. All right, we're going to take a little break and we'll be back with the bronze. And we're back and it's time for us to head over to the bronze and have ourselves a Bloomin' Onion and some non-alcoholic beer because we're still underaged on the show at this time. And hear what our listeners had to say bronze things things of bronze the first up is from abby who said man oh man the first time we see the first and what a journey it'll eventually take us on i loved seeing angel in his human life and getting some backstory he kind of sucked as a human it would seem but he makes amends for that and then it's a little hands making hearts emoji (laughs) And then Becky says, hello all, thoughts on season three, episode 10. I can't with Angel's wig and mustache. Hello. Oh yeah, yeah, they did yeah. look pretty bad. That was <laughs> And his, and accent, his yeah. accent. Oh Lord. yeah, the accent is so <laughs> bad. <laughs> I know, I tried to defend it early on. I'm like, no, I can't defend that. No, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> this could have been titled <sighs> Ghosts of Victims Past. Yep. Buffy looks cute in the lacy skirt and boots. Willow's pants, though. No bueno. (laughs) Very sweet moments with Willow and Oz. I love his speech to her and her face when he says he wants to give it another try. It was hilariously adorable how she tried to seduce him. His response, you don't have anything to prove to me, was so sweet. Heart. Mm -hmm. Joyce's very quick no when Buffy mentioned inviting Giles was funny and a nice callback to band candy. Also, it was very sweet when Faith showed up to hang with Joyce and Buffy for Christmas Eve. First time I've actually felt sorry for Xander. I loved it when he showed up to help and owned up to being an an a-hole regarding Angel. (laughs) It was great seeing the gang all together and back at work. Loved the Giles Angel scene when Angel showed up at his house. It was great seeing Jenny back, even if she was just a manifestation of the first. I like that it was her the first used as the main person to torture Angel about his past. Robia Scott's acting skills were on full display in this episode. Sad she's no longer a permanent part of the show. I laughed when Angel showed up to tell Buffy she has to stay away from him. Very Edward Cullen. 
Oh my god, I didn't think about that, but it totally is very Edward Cullen. That's funny. Oh man. And then she goes on to say, "If it's so hot in Sunnydale, why is everyone wearing coats?" Yep. Yep. Uh, she said, "Although Sarah Michelle Gellar does look great in that trench coat, I think that's why they're all wearing coats because it's great for the." Costumes. I mean, she does. She has great coats on this show. Um, powerful scenes at the end between Buffy and Angel. Both actors did a phenomenal job. A very raw and honest interaction. And she said, the faces of everyone when the snow started to fall loved it. I took that snow as a sign from above that it isn't Angel's time to go yet. From above or yeah. below. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> her favorite quote was Buffy when talking evil with the first. All right. I get it. You're evil. Do we have to chat about it all night? Oh, it's a good moment. <laughs> Uh, this episode does not land in my top 20 of episodes, but it was a good one. I think it was a great way for Angel to come to terms with the negative sides of his past and realize the good in him is worth saving. I think it also gave Giles an opportunity to say some of what he needed to say to be able to try and move on with what Angel did. It also opens the door for the biggest bad of them all, and that makes me very excited for future episodes. Have a great week. Grr. Arg. Thank you, Becky. And then Steve says, I'm on vacation, cannot record a voicemail. Can't wait to hear this one. Sad. Great episode where I think we learn why Angel was returned. Or at least we learn why the first <laughs> wants mm-hmm. credit for Angel's return. <laughs> Uh, we got one voicemail from our good friend sam who is going to be on next week for the episode gingerbread hey benny and carrot sam ah the episode of men's has one of my core buffy memories from many many years ago when i first watched it of that scene where buffy and angel are overlooking sunnydale it's getting ready to be sunrise and he's just like this world wants me gone. And then she just looks up at him and she goes, well, what about me? I mean, obviously Sarah Michelle Gellar does this far better than I do. And she just transforms from this rock star vampire slayer into this vulnerable teenage girl. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is why we love you. Like you are such a duality and this is so relatable. And it was just such a beautiful scene. And, of course, it starts snowing because, well, I don't want to say any spoilers. Like, we know there's plans for an angel. And and this episode, I'd forgotten how heinous Angelus actually was. Like, I mean, we kind of knew. I just, I'd forgotten it. I was like, oh, boy, it's hard to feel bad for him. Like, like Jenny Callender showing up and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, it was Angelus, but, yeah, he, he still did it. They're still dead. So it's still, it was just really interesting. I really, really liked how they wrote and directed this. And and if I'd forgotten about this, it didn't click, like, the first time I watched this. Obviously, I was younger than Buffy when I first watched this. And then I'm watching it now, and I'm like, the beginning of the episode, Angel looks terrified after he sees that ghost. I mean, truly terrified. And Buffy's just like, what's up, 250-year-old vampire who's been to hell and back? You look a little freaked out. But she just, like, does not follow up on it until later when she has the dream. And it's like, come on, Vampire Slayer. <laughs> like, I know you're a 17-year-old girl. But, like, also, like, come on. Th- that should have set off some warning signs in you. Kind of like when birds flee in a forest. Like, they're running from something. Yeah, Angel was afraid of something <laughs> that scared him. And all this episode made me feel bad for Xander, which was an uncomfortable feeling. I mean, Cordy outing him publicly about his family being abusive alcoholics and then him sleeping outside. I'm like, I get that he used to go over to Willow's and stuff like that. And they're kind of in an awkward place. But Buffy, invite your awkward friend over for Christmas. (laughs) You're going to make him sleep outside? Like, that's kind of a terrible friend move (laughs) you invited faith (laughs) so yeah so i just felt bad for him and that made me have the warm feelies for xander and that's not my comfy place with him (laughs) looking forward to the podcast thanks sam a great voicemail as always and uh some stuff to think about you're right that buffy's 
instincts should have reacted to that, but she's so messed up about Angel and trying so hard to stay away from him that she didn't follow up on it. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that should have set off alarm bells. It reminds me in that episode, um, Dead Man's Party, when um, Xander is sort of like watching over Joyce while all the, the chaos is happening. And he's like, oh, generally when scary things get scared, that's not a good sign. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, Buffy sort of should have taken that into account when Angel freaks out and runs away. Like, well, oh, maybe something bad is happening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's the end of the main section of the podcast. Stay tuned for the Watcher's Diaries if you want to hear the spoilery parts. And if you'd like to join the conversation, you can find all of our contact information at podcastica.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash podcastica or our Still Slaying cast page on Facebook. You can also find us on Instagram at Still Slaying Cast, and you can always send an email or a recorded voice message to Still Slaying Feedback at gmail.com. And all this information will also be in the show notes, so you can just scroll down and find it, or it's on podcastica.com where you will also find links to our social media pages and all the other Podcastica shows. And launching this week is a new show that's premiering tonight on AMC+. Plus. It's The Ones Who Live, or what most people are calling the Rashone Show or the Rick and Michonne Show. But it's, a, it's another Walking Dead universe show. It's very highly anticipated. And our friends over at the cast of us will be covering it. They're also doing a live instant reaction after every episode on YouTube. So this podcast won't be out in time for you to listen to tonight's but listen to, you can you can tune into some future ones what other podcasts are you guys listening to these days Let's see, i am still going back and listening to the cobra kai cast for the first couple of seasons in anticipation of the new season and that's been really fun to listen to actually um and i also started going back and re-listening to Yellow Jackets. Um, I just, I miss that show so much. So I've been putting that podcast on while I'm working. <laughs> How about you, Kelly? Um, I've been listening to the rewatch of The Walking Dead on um, Nice. The cast it's of been good. And like getting caught up on here too, so I'm finally caught up. Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, we <laughs> move fast, so gotta get caught up. Yeah. <laughs> And if you like what we do, hit like, follow, and subscribe, and leave us a five-star rating if you're feeling like it. And next time, tune in for Season 3, Episode 11, Gingerbread, which I am so excited to cover. Thanks, everyone. And what are you doing for Christmas? Being Jewish. Remember, people, not everybody worships Santa. (laughs) All right, that's the end of the non-spoiler section. If you want to avoid spoilers, you should stop listening right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. On to The Watcher's Diaries. All spoilers, all the time. It's too bad we can't sneak a look at The Watcher Diaries. I'm sure it's full of fun facts to know and tell. Yeah. That's too bad. That stuff is private. Also, Giles keeps them in his office in his personal files. Most importantly, it would be wrong. So many spoilers. So many spoilers about the first (laughs) and about powers that he... So when we get Angel gets his own show, he interacts a lot with the, quote, powers that be, right? He visits Mm -hmm. oracles who connect him to the powers that be. They talk about the powers that be all the time and that the powers that be are assumed to be in favor of Angel and his redemption arc and making amends for all of his evil doings. But then it gets kind of confusing when Jasmine is born Mm -hmm. and reveals that she (laughs) was behind a lot of the things that have happened to Angel in order Mm -hmm. to create a baby that would be a host for her to be born into. So Mm -hmm. it's unclear if she and the first work together, if the first 
is just taking credit for something that it didn't do because it would upset Angel. If yeah. if they have similar agendas, if they have competing agendas, we know that Wolfram and Hart also has an agenda for Angel. They want him alive, right? They specifically never kill him on that show because they want him to be part of the apocalypse. And they're not sure if that's in a capacity for good or for evil, but they know it's going to be a big role. And then we find out that the prophecies that Angel is mentioned in and relies on, like the one that says that after his big role in the apocalypse, he'll get to be human again, were Mm -hmm. a lot of those were faked by Sajan to Mm -hmm. manipulate events so that he could kill Connor before Connor killed him. And Connor. And then we also find out later that Spike has a soul. So then all the prophecies that refer to the vampire with a mm-hmm. soul. Not necessarily just about Angel. They might not have been about Angel at all. They might be about Spike. Not that Spike has had a soul the whole time. Spike gets a soul right. in season yeah. seven of Buffy. He is re insult Or no, at the very end of season six, not, <laughs> not in season seven. Uh, oh, so it's, it. you know, from just this episode, it's hard to know. If they had, I don't think they that the writers had any idea where all of that stuff was going. Where they were yeah, going. right. Well, and I wonder if they if they had an idea for some of it, because you know, there's always been this assumption or speculation that the powers that be are responsible, possibly for this, you know, miraculous snowfall in Sunnydale mm-hmm. that saves Angel's life because they have a purpose for him along with Wolfram and Hart and you know I like that explanation honestly I like if they had thought that out because it it makes sense and we do know that this show is pretty good about planning for the future and keeping up with continuity and foreshadowing certain things but I like the idea that the powers that be are interfering this early on and it's not that far out of the realm of possibility since it's at the end of this season that you know angel moves to los angeles so presumably some of the writing for angel or some of the plot has already been established so i could see this being you know a part of that but i always wonder just how much they knew at this point in time and with the with the first i always assume also that the first is just taking credit Mm -hmm. for bringing him back and really the only thing i can think of is the first wanting to create that havoc and you know just be evil yeah. overall because i don't see what else the the plan would be if it's not key whether or not angel lives or dies you know they do try to convince him to kill buff kill buffy and give in to the demon inside him basically saying you know the torture will end as long as you give in to these baser instincts that purely seems for chaos i can't think of any other real purpose i mean the goal is either to turn angel evil to kill angel to wound or kill buffy yeah or to somehow just break angel and buffy apart to make sure that they aren't allies even yeah um which would be a blow to you know good or the forces of good we've got forces of evil so you know but we don't know if the powers that be are good or evil. They're just powerful. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are good or evil. Yeah. They just, they have, you know, they have something that they are seeking to protect, which is Angel's life at this point in time. And there's manipulation involved, but that, like you said, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil. Yeah, something else that bugs me, we later on when the first appears, it's very, very clear that it's non-corporeal and it's a hard for Buffy to fight because she can't physically fight it. She's used to being able to physically fight things. But the first ruffles 
Angel's hair a bit, like touches him in this episode. So clearly they didn't have it all planned out. Yeah. At At this point, point. (laughs) as Jenny Calendar, she's like holding his hands. So yeah, uh, yeah, I was like, wait, that's touching. That's breaking the first rules that we don't (laughs) learn for four more seasons. Like, yep. Yeah. I was like, that doesn't make sense. So yeah, they retconned that a little bit in season seven with the first. And I don't think Giles explains that the first can only take the physical form of someone who has died. I don't think we get that explanation here. I think we don't get that until season seven. Yeah, because I, I, gosh, I need, I, part of me wants to go forward and start watching some of those episodes just (laughs) because they're so interesting, particularly when, uh, the Cassie character mm. comes into the mix where, you know, she knows she's going to die. And that episode is one of the ones I remember truly scaring me and unsettling me. And I think that's a large part because of the nature of the first as a villain. And I know we will talk about this when we get there. People are very polarized on the first as a villain and how successful that was. But I love it. <laughs> Even if there are holes. <laughs> Um, I do love too how, like we talked about how well this sets up Angel and like you mentioned, Penny, Buffy's speech to him is really what drives him into wanting to make amends. And it's, you know, a large part of the motive behind the opening of Angel Investigations is, you know, the idea of the whole helping the helpless And being this champion of the helpless. So as much as sometimes this episode can seem kind of, I don't know, slow or bogged down in some of the more, I don't know, dramatic monologuing, I do love how well it sets up Angel's character because it makes sense for that spinoff. I 100% understand him making the choice to leave Los Angeles, leave Buffy, have that separation and go to Los Angeles and try to help people that are in need. So I do like the way that they start to set that up in this episode. It's interesting that Buffy and Angel sort of unspokenly get back together at the end of this episode. Just because Angel I guess because they've just revealed to each other how in love they are with each other and then Angel doesn't get killed and then they're just holding hands. It's like, oh, look at that. The world put us back together. But uh, right. It's still really risky for them to be a couple and also really unhealthy for Buffy. Because even then he could have felt this like moment of true happiness could have come in with Buffy saving Mm -hmm. him and him realizing that he still Mm -hmm. has a chance like they don't have to have sex in order for the (laughs) curse to kick back in so him being around the one person that he loves is always going to be risky that's why I think in the previously on maybe they show xander saying something that line about giving angel a happy happy yeah but i'm like man they would be way more worried if they actually realized (laughs) how the curse operated i think but you know luckily angel's still tortured enough that nothing's quite gonna make him truly happy at this point in time so broody Mm -hmm. so broody Oh, yeah. And fun fact, uh, I don't know if y'all paid attention to the layout and the geography of where he was. What is it? Kingman, Kingsman. I can't talk. Kingman's Bluff is where Angel is wanting to stand and expose himself to the sun and kill himself. And that is the same exact spot where Dark Willow is standing when she decides to basically destroy the world in season, what is it? Is it season seven or is that a comic? I can't remember, but I think it's, it's a very interesting landmark in Sunnydale. I don't know where it's actually filmed. I would assume Los Angeles. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was wondering if that was the same bluff where, where Willow tries to destroy the world. But it, it makes sense that it would be. 
boy. There's just so much to come that stems from this episode. I'm so looking forward to watching Angel. I have been having the hardest time ever not binging. Me too. (laughs) It is brutal. I really, really, really want to watch it. I had been up to this point, and I haven't. You haven't gone ahead, gone past it. Yeah, I've been yeah. waiting. Yeah, yeah thank but you for. We'll see if I can hold on to that. <laughs> it's so hard. It is so hard. We're all so used to binging too, right? It's just a it's seriously just something we're we conditioned do. now. When well, when Jason and Lucy started the Walking Dead rewatch on the cast of us, I was like, I'm going to watch along with them, and I made it like three episodes, <laughs> and then I was just yeah. like, woo, off yeah. and running, binging ahead. I couldn't help myself. Yep. I know. Like, I'm up to season seven yeah. already. Because like, <laughs> I'm watching it with my daughter, too. Been- oh, nice. That's, That's good. Fun. That's something I really miss is the water cooler aspect of shows and, and watching with people and catching up with them after. Buffy was a big one for me. In the early 2000s, when I was at a law firm, I found a few other Buffy fans, and we would have, like, Uh, every Wednesday we'd get together for coffee and talk about the episode and it was a nice way for me to have some socializing at the law firm that was comfortable and not about the law and not about work and and you know something we all bonded about that was that was nice and then Lost did that for me when I was at my next job after that it was it was there was like a lost lunch that we would have after Lost aired uh and it's just it's not really like that anymore. Game of Thrones, most people watched it pretty quickly after it came out on Sunday nights, but not everyone. So you'd always have this yeah. like, don't tell me what <laughs> happened. Like I have, I'm two episodes behind. I'm three episodes behind. And I, I looked for a long time to find people to do the, you know, day after chat with me about walking dead until I figured out about the podcast. And, and I was like, Oh, yeah. finally, at least it feels like <laughs> yeah. I'm having a conversation with people. It's true. Oh, I did find a quote from JW about the snowfall and the powers that be. Oh, interesting. So he said, the snow was good. Was it God? Well, I'm an atheist, but it's hard to ignore the idea of a Christmas miracle here. The fact is the Christian mythos has a powerful fascination to me and it bleeds into my storytelling. Redemption, hope, purpose santa these are all important to me whether i believe in an afterlife or some universal structure or not i certainly don't mind a strictly christian interpretation being placed on this ep by those who believe that i just hope it's not limited to that so i was like well thanks for being vague (laughs) but i think it's still it's one of those where he can't Mm -hmm. directly say yeah we planned it but he likes the idea of it being the powers that be speaking of christianity um it's come up i think a couple of times in research for episodes where jenny calendar appeared but this one in particular uh after she guest starred as the first robia scott ended up converting to Christianity, became a born again Christian, basically disavowed the show, said she never would have portrayed this character if she knew it was truly like the first evil. And I was like, well, that's kind of something you say in the episode, but that's fine. Yeah. The the dialogue is not (laughs) subtle. Yeah. She equates it to Satan and basically says that that, would not have aligned with her beliefs at that time and she ultimately ended up abandoning her acting career and became a missionary and then a life coach oh so i thought that was was interesting that is really interesting because i've always wondered why we never saw more of her and that explains it perfectly Mm -hmm. she is not acting anymore because she's very good yeah yeah she is very good and beautiful Ugh. That usually yeah. is a requirement in Hollywood, too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, gosh. I just can't wait for all the different instances of seeing the first. I had written down in my notes all the different characters they appear as and appear to, but that's just, that's for later. <laughs> that's for later, yeah. <laughs> okay, that is the complete end of our show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate you. And we love doing this, so it means the world to us that we even have listeners at all. 
Until next <laughs> time, I am Penny. And I'm Kelly. And I'm Kara. Keep, Keep swaying. swaying.